Welcome to the Random Encounter Show. I'm Def Stalker 5. Here lately, I've been getting some comments, uh, some messages on the Facebook page, and chatting with people on the on our Facebook group, the Random Encounter Army. And uh, a lot of that discussion seems to be aimed toward uh, role-playing game rule systems, what I use, why I use them, uh, etc. So I thought it would be a great time to do an episode where we focus not on my rule systems or the rule systems that I really enjoy. There will be a little bit of that here. But no, I wanted to discuss different things that I use, different factors, if you will, to really assess, judge, or determine if I want to use a certain rule set or maybe purchase another rule set. Uh, now, if you're new around here, you may not be used to the way I discuss things because I consider myself a hobby gamer. We are becoming a very rare breed amongst a pop culture explosion of things like Dungeons and Dragons. So to clarify what I mean by that is the majority of your casual players of role-playing games. When they purchase a role-playing game rule system, they are purchasing a game. They'll use it uh, as written, the materials and stuff, they'll just play it as a game. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, I do that sometimes. But as a hobby gamer, I separate the role-playing game rule systems from my game. And what I mean by that is that the rule systems themselves, uh, you could say they're tool sets, or maybe they're an engine, and the game is what happens on the table. So the tools are the engines there to build or run the game that I envision that takes place on my table. Maybe that makes sense to you. I don't know. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Okay, uh, so let's dive off a little bit into this subject, a little bit of game philosophy. Uh, this video may take a while, so I, I don't believe that I can give you any worthwhile information on topics like these in five to ten minutes. So make sure you have something to drink. Uh, come sit at the game table, get comfortable, and we'll, we'll discuss this. And hopefully, whether you're a beginner or you're someone looking to get into a more hobby-centric view set of gaming, that this video will be a helping hand uh, toward that end for you of choosing rule sets for your games. So, let's just start off. We're looking for a, we're, we're going to be looking for a rule set. Now, Maybe you've never bought a rule set before. Maybe you're try you're, you're wanting to play a different style game. The first factor I would look at would be genre. Okay, that would be the first consideration. What I mean by genre is that role-playing games follow along the same fiction genres that TV shows and movies, along with novels and fiction works, follow. Uh, in the role-playing game industry, your medieval fantasy is by far your largest, most encompassing genre. That's your Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth. That's your Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian. Uh, that's your Robert Jordan's Will of Time. Now, science fiction takes a big part of our role-playing game industry. And it seems to be becoming more and more popular as time goes forward. Uh, there's another genre's pulp. You know, that would be the early 20th century. Uh, whether it's mixed with fantasy or sci-fi, or it's just straight up historic, maybe detective private eye kind of stuff, or, or steampunk, whatever. And then another popular genre is your futuristic dystopian mega corporation type of uh, near future settings, Blade Runner-esque, uh, cyberpunk, that kind of thing. 
So there's, but there's more and more genres. That's just a small sampling because there are thousands of great role playing rule systems and games for you to choose from. So in considering genre, you know, I want to play a science fiction game. I want to play a medieval fantasy game. I want to play a historic game, whatever. That's the first thing that you've got to lock down uh, is to choose your genre. Okay, the second thing, or the se second factor, I should say, deals with versatility. Versatility is very important for me, especially if you're beginning or you're looking for your core systems. Okay, versatility makes all the difference here. Let's say we want to, we, let's, let's take for example, I watched the Alien movies last week. Ridley Scott's Aliens and the sec our Alien in the second movie Aliens. I like the first movie better. I know I'm in a minority, but hey. But let's just say I wanted to play the first Ridley Scott Alien uh, science fiction horror type game. I could go on the market and I could research an Alien RPG. I believe that Free League Publishing could be wrong. I, I really haven't looked at the game. I've seen it in passing, but I know in the last year or two, they've published an alien RPG. Now, I'm not saying that that would not be perfect for you, but especially if you're thinking about your core systems here, you know, your main backbone of your RPG library. What I want you to consider is if you buy Alien as one of your core games or your first role-playing game, it's probably going to be fantastic for playing in the Alien setting. Okay, the Whaling Corporation, the, the different planets and things. It's probably going to be fantastic. But, let's say, five, down, five months down the road, you watch Star Wars. Or maybe you get into Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, the, uh, it, whatever. And you say, you know, I'm sort of growing bored with the Alien game. I would really like to... Uh, i really like to play in the Star Wars universe or the Star Trek universe. Now, using the Alien RPG to do that is going to basically walk up here on the snow analogy. It's very difficult because it is a setting locked game. It's a game that owned the right to aliens, so the whole game surrounds that setting. So... Now you're looking at buying another role-playing game down the road. If you buy the Star Trek game or you buy the Star Wars game, now you have two RPGs that are setting locked. Uh, I say leave that alone, and I'll give you several reasons. Leave it alone, though. I, I really don't go for the setting lock games whatsoever. First off, the setting lock games, uh, they normally go all out for the setting itself. So the setting material is normally fantastic. Case in point, Iron Crown Enterprises Middle Earth Role Playing, or MERP. The setting material was so good for that... It was the first role playing game set in Middle Earth. But the setting material for it was so good that when Peter Jackson came to write the movies, he actually used the source material from MERP. That's how good it is. And, and that's the same for a lot of role-playing games that are setting-specific. But on the other hand, the rule systems that power those games tend to be very lackluster. Okay, that's just my experience. I've got decades into this, but that's just my experience. So, looking at a core system, instead of getting a setting lock system... Let's talk about science fiction, for example. One of my core science fiction role-playing games is Traveler. It's been around since the 70s. This is the Mongoose published second edition of Traveler. Fantastic. Now, with Traveler, I will have to do a little legwork, but I am beyond sure 
I could run a fantastic campaign in any science fiction universe you can imagine. From the Alien universe, to Star Wars, to Star Trek, to Firefly, to Babylon 5, I can run it. Why? Because Traveler, while it does provide a setting, the Imperium, wow, that, I mean, wow, okay, but it does provide a, it, it does provide a setting the core rule books are generally free from any setting locked particular rules. So with Traveler, especially the Mongoose edition, your core books really don't have any setting material in them. You would have to go and purchase, you know, the different box sets and, and, and different sets to get the setting to add to the game. So that makes it very, very versatile for science fiction role playing. Uh, and the rules are fantastic. So with those rules that are fantastic, I do the legwork and I add the setting material. I'm very sure I'm going to come off with a better game for myself and on my table than if I bought the Alien RPG or the Star Trek RPG, uh, etc. And the same goes for all genres. Uh, if you bought MURP, okay, the Middle Earth role playing game. It's easier in fantasy than sci-fi for some reason, but let's say I wanted to play a no magic sort of, or low magic anyway, uh, low fantasy campaign. Uh, Conan the Barbarian, for example. I would have to do a lot of legwork to remove the Middle Earth setting material from that rule set to play Conan. S vice versa, if I bought a Conan RPG and wanted to play in Middle Earth, it would take a lot of work with the rule mechanics and the setting to make that happen. But, you know, with a game like Castles and Crusades here, you know, another one of my core games for fantasy, uh, it's really versatile. There's no set setting uh, in these rules. They can, they, you can make them work for anything. And the rules are fantastic especially for a class and level system, which do not do not tend to be my favorites. We'll get into that in a little bit. But anyway, versatility. I say, especially if you're beginning and you're buying your first RPG, or if you find yourself buying a lot of RPGs over time and you want to build a core library like I have, versatility is the way to go. Now, speaking on genre and versatility, some of you, are, I'm sure, are thinking of Agnostic genre settings, or not settings, agnostic genre rule sets. A few come to mind uh, that I've tried. GURPS and Genesis by Fantasy Flight Games. Okay, I'm sure they have their fans out there. I'm not knocking these games. I can only give you my perspective. But in trying out both those systems, you know, no matter what, no matter what you did in it, it never really felt complete. You know, if you, let's just take Genesis for example. It's, it, you know, it's agnostic. It should be ready to go for anything. So you buy the core book. You don't have enough rules there to run any setting. So let's decide, hey, we want to run fantasy. Well, with Genesis, all of a sudden, all versatility is gone because you have you when you buy the fantasy book or fantasy genre setting for Genesis, it's in Terranoth, which is a very exotic sort of fantasy world that's based on what I consider the old world of the Games Workshop Warhammer fantasy. Uh, but it's setting locked there. You've lost all versatility there. Not only that, but you have to keep buying more and more books. And no matter how many books you buy, and no matter what setting or genre that you play in, it never feels like a complete rule set. And they tend to, like Genesis, rely on very gimmicky uh, mechanics. You know, Genesis has specialized dice and dice pools and all this kind of stuff. It's just gimmicky trying to be different. And it was a headache. It was, it was out the window here. Uh, GURPS was a little bit better, but again, it never really felt complete. And it, no matter how many books you bought, which you'll need a bunch, it never, 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 never came off feeling like a full, rule, coherent rule system. 
Okay, so that little caveat's out the way. Hey, I'm just sharing my honest opinion here with you. The next next factor we would look at with role-playing games, we've, we've locked genre down what we want. We've locked down that we want a versatile system, especially if we're building a core library or, a beginning, or we're buying our first RPG system. What's the next thing that we're going to look at? The next factor in this would be what a lot of people sort of overlook, I think. But it's how we're going, how am, how am I planning to play this game on the table? Uh, or not necessarily even on the table. What I mean by that is I'm so, I'm primarily a solitaire player. You can, I, I can solo play any rule system that exists. Uh, but some rule systems do play better solo than others. Uh, but I also do in-person gaming sometimes. So if I'm playing an in-person game, I have other people to consider. Or maybe I'm going to play online. Now, I have no knowledge or expertise in using the virtual role-playing game services to have the digital tables and little miniatures and all that. When I play online, we kick it old school. It's, my, it, it's, it's the way to go for me. You know, pen and paper on the table, real dice on the table, use Zoom. You know, storytelling takes the foremost element of my online gaming and, uh, yeah, maybe some screen sharing or something across Zoom. So your mileage may vary there. When I don't know something, when I really don't know a whole lot about something, you can depend on me to tell you, hey, I really don't know a whole lot about that. And that's true with online gaming with the virtual services. But knowing who I'm playing with and how I'm going to play this is very important for determining my rule system of what I want it to do for the game I plan on playing. Uh, uh, the, the next factor goes right into that. This next factor, uh, a lot of people confuse it with complexity. I do not use the term or the definition or whatever you want to say complexity to rule sets of role-playing games. I've never came across a role-playing game that was complex for me. Uh, all, of, all of them, no matter what I've played, have, have been basic mathematical operations. I've never had to leave what we would consider PEMDAS, you know, mathematics, grade school mathematics. Now, if I played a game that had me, you know, plugging in trigonometry to figure out bow and arrow shots or gunshots or if i if i'm running calculus or st statistical math or large algebraic expressions or formulas with 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 wild variables and stuff in them i might consider that complex okay i'm not gonna lie but i've never ran into that i'm not saying they don't exist i'm just saying in the mainstream of gaming i've never ran into that and i can't imagine that many publishers would be interested in trying to sell those games to people. Uh, it's certainly not going to be a huge pool of potential buyers there. So I say let's do away with this whole complexity rating. It's nonsense. What people are confusing with complexity is the level of detail present in rule systems. So let's just make a mental image here. Let me set down the ruler here. On one side, of we're going to create a scale, a linear scale here. On this side, we've got completely abstraction, or complete abstraction, or abstract. On this side, we have full detail. Okay? Now, all role-playing games are on this scale somewhere along the lines. Uh, there's never going to be a completely abstract role-playing game because it simply couldn't exist. There would be no definition to anything. There would be no uh, probability results when rolling dice and things. It would be completely abstract. On the other side is you have complete detail. This is in the realm of impossibility as well because the rule system would need a... a need a rule for every single thing a player or a game master could imagine happening uh, circumstances environments whatever 
that's obviously not going to happen either. And uh, because all role-playing games basically come down to a tool set that gives definition to things game in-game in related and gives us a system of determining results on character actions and our, when I, our entity actions within the game. Okay? So, but we have this scale. Now, my core library, I, I, I really like to have the scale covered for different reasons. But let's talk about starting the very center of the scale. I know that's an odd place to start, but it's, it's a good place to start. Because this is your gateway games. This is your class and level games. Dungeons and Dragons. Pathfinder. Castles and Crusades. All of your D20 style games. The OSR movement. Everything sits right here in the middle. Now the vast majority of games are here. And the vast majority of players are here. When it comes to why is it in the middle and why are there so many games and players here? Because they are essentially the easiest games for beginners to play and the easiest games for players to enjoy and game masters to run with minimal effort on all sides. People tend toward the path of least resistance, if you will. So our class and level systems, they tell you what to play and how to play it. They give you options, you know, decisions to make. But after you're done choosing your options, your race, your class, and any other options, your level progression and what you're going to be able to do and everything is predetermined by the rule set for you. That's very easy to follow along. And of course, different games give different options throughout the span of a character's progression. But there's still no freedom whatsoever for the players. It requires no mental investment or creative investment, really. I guess you can sort of put yourself on my uh, mental cruise control, as I call it. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, I definitely have my class and level systems for various reasons. But why do, what's going on here? Well, these systems, they have enough detail, okay, that give basically how to play and what to play, what the, what the game is on the table for players. There's not a whole lot of creativity that has to take place. Uh, there's not a whole lot of problem solving that has to take place. There can be, but most of the time it's covered, you know. Uh, so it has enough detail to keep the game rolling with very little input. But it has enough abstraction that it doesn't take a large mental investment to learn this rule set. You know, there's not a, there's not a, there's not a lot of subsystems and, and, and various details to keep track of such as the D20 systems, <laughs> you know, hey, everything's got its place. Uh, let's move over to more abstract games. I'll show you one of my favorites. Tunnels and Trolls here. Very cool abstract game. It's really toward the abstract, Tunnels and Trolls is. Uh, it gives you enough rules to get the game going, okay? It gives you some character creation rules. It gives you your combat rules. It gives you some magic rules. It gives you some suggestions here and there for things. But the big difference is, is that it gives you those rules and then tells you, do whatever you want with them. So with more abstract games, the rules tend to be fast playing and very loose. And you would say, well, why wouldn't beginners want to start with those games? And it's because it doesn't have the detail that tells you what to do with the game <laughs> is, is basically the, the, the story of that. Uh, 
with abstract games. Storytelling is the main element of those games. Uh, the rule systems them themselves take the back seat. They're second place at best. Uh, they require a lot of creativity from the players and the game master. Everything's fast and loose. So it's, it's, it, there's, there's no system there that keeps you in line as you go, basically. And far fewer players make it to the abstract side. Most tend to stay in the very center of the gateway systems, the casual systems. Uh, it's a shame, really. Uh, I think Tunnels and Trolls is, is a, a fantastic system. We'll get more into Tunnels and Trolls, especially throughout the future episodes of the things. But if you're a beginner player, it, was, it would be one I'm looking at. And I'll show you how to overcome these abstract ideas and make that game your own. You know, but it definitely promotes hobby gaming. You know, you're, you're, buying, this, you're buying this rule set and it's up to you to play it. What you're going to do with it. You know, there's no hand holding throughout the book. Now we're going to venture into my favorite area of gaming, especially as a solo player, but where few dare to enter. And that's the more detailed side of gaming. The more detailed a rule system is, the less players you're going to find for it. Why? Because even though they all share, you know, a basic core mechanic. Let's let's take Rollmaster for example. That's one people really shy away from that I absolutely love. It has an easy core rule mechanic, D100 mechanic. It has different subsystems to handle different situations in the game, from combat to magic to to all kind of various stuff. And it has a lot of detailed rules that generate a lot of data that continues the game forward, sometimes in very surprising directions. I absolutely love it for solo play. We're going to get into Rollmaster big time here as well. But a lot of people tend to shy away because of the mental investment. You're not going to sit down and in a couple of hours being a greenhorn or brand new to one of the very detailed rule systems, be ready to roll up a character and start playing the game. Uh, it's just not going to happen. In fact, it will probably take you several weeks, if not months, of studying the rule system and getting experience on the table before it becomes really natural to you. So it's nowhere near as easy as even the class and level systems, but especially the abstract systems. They usually take longer to play these detailed systems. It's generating the game for you, basically. You still get, just like abstract, you still get total freedom and, and, and storytelling and everything else. We'll, we'll, we'll look at some examples. You know, that, that, that would pr probably be a good thing of how we, how I look at game systems and, and read about them and study them to figure out just how abstract or detailed they are because I think to me that's the most important determination for a game. One of the things I look at is how combat is handled. Okay, we can start with our class and level gateway systems, castles and crusades, for example, which is my favorite and basically the only one I really care about playing anymore. Uh, with these class and level systems, typically combat is broken down into rounds and during these rounds, every individual entity, a character, NPC, monster, whatever, uh, takes a turn and commits to an action or maybe two actions depending on the system. So they may move and, and, and strike with a, with, a, with a melee weapon or shoot a bow or cast a spell, whatever. Okay, they roll a dice. It tells them, are you successful or you're not successful? If you're not successful, play moves on. If you are successful, 
you roll a dice, normally two are a die, I should say, to determine some damage. Everything in combat is represented with basically a pool of hit points, and you just minus hit points off of those pools. Now, you can definitely bring in more detail to that if you wish from outside, but generally as written, that's how combat is. Okay, let's go to abstraction. Let's go to tunnels and trolls. Combat there is in rounds, but in, as written, individual characters don't necessarily, in the normal circumstances, take an individual action at all. It's very fast and very abstract. All the characters that are in battle will determine how many dice each character rolls. They will roll it as a dice pool. The game master determines how many dice these monsters or the group or whatever they're facing. They throw their dice in together as a dice pool. You roll these together, okay? Uh, you add and subtract modifiers, but basically whichever side rolled the highest wins the combat, and the difference in between the two sides' numbers is the damage done to the losing side. Now, the Lux, you know, there's spike damage and stuff to take in consideration too, but that's just how abstract that is. Uh, let's move to the more detailed systems. Let's take Rollmaster uh, Standard System, for example, the third edition. Combats in 10 second rounds. After determining an initiative, everyone decides what their character, their monster, whatever is going to do. It has 10 seconds to do whatever it wants to do. Uh, the rules specify all the different actions and things that you could come up with, and it also gives you a way of determining things that aren't written, if that's a possibility. I don't know, it's very detailed. <laughs> but instead of you can do one action or you can move or whatever, everything gets percentage points. So maybe we have a, 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 a fighter or something, a, a man going into combat. He wants to pull his sword, uh, charge 20 feet into combat, and slash a goblin with the sword. Well, he's got to figure a few things out here. First, he's got to pull his sword. That's 20% of those 10 seconds you can use. Now he wants to move 20 feet. Okay, that's probably going to be around 40%. So he's already at 60% of his time taken for those two actions. Now, if he wants to swing his sword, you know, in an offensive manner, he has to decide how much offense, you know, how, how much of his offense bonus he's going to apply to this swing and how much he's going to hold back in case he needs to have some defensive maneuvering going on. So that may take, you know... 40%, 80%, who knows? It, it, it determines on how powerful of a swing he actually wants to throw. Uh, let's say he determines it out and he gets he has to have it within 100%. But he determines it out and he gets it done. Okay. There's no simple AC in these detailed rule systems. No. In fact, first we'll have to, we'll have to determine what type of armor the goblin's wearing. Then we'll have to determine how that weapon reacts to that, ver that, that type of armor. Okay, whereas... Oh, we won't, we won't have to... We'll, we'll, we'll get into Rollmaster, <laughs> definitely, here. If you guys don't fall asleep, or if you're not asleep by now, wake up! Uh, but anyways, he, he, he attacks it. You, you, you go down these charts, you figure out exactly where the armor, ta uh, armor type is. You roll, you, you da 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 You come up with data. You've generated data at this point. Now it may, it normally would give you some type of damage data represented in a numerical form uh, that would take off hit points. But it would also give you more data. Uh, does it knock the, knock, knock the opponent prone? Does it, does it stun the opponent? Does it damage the, 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 the weapon? Does it damage the armor? Uh, also, does it generate a critical hit? Here comes another table. On the critical hit, it could be anything from it bounces off the piece of armor and cuts a strap off of it and the armor's dangling off the, the enemy to it severs its left arm. The opponent goes prone and is bleeding and will die within six combat rounds if first aid's not applied. 
So, as you can see, the detailed side, I mean, weapon speeds, uh, weapon lengths, all this stuff, it's just very detailed. It goes for a level of realism. The more abstract the system is, the less realism is involved with the game. So, that's a great way. Character creation is another way to look to see how abstract the system is. With Tunnels and Trolls, I promise you, even if I was brand new, I could go over to character creation, a few pages of material, and I could roll up a character within 15 minutes and have my full character sheet on an index card. Okay? Rollmaster, third edition. Give me a few hours. If I haven't, if I've never done it, give me a few days. <laughs> but give me a few hours. Uh, the last character sheet I believe I used was six pages long, you know, for the, to fully flesh out the full system of Rollmaster Standard. Uh, Rollmaster 2nd Edition is a little bit easier. Merp's a really easy version of Rollmaster, but we're not going to get into that in this episode. But looking at character creation, combat, and such things will give you an idea of how abstract the system is. Now we come to one to, that's very important to me as well. And that's, you've got a game system. It's been on the market for several years. This will tell you a lot of what you need to know about a rule system. Uh, most hobby-centric rule systems that promote the style of gaming that I've been talking about, you know, where the game is on the table, the rule systems are the engine. Do what you want with them, make them happen. Uh, whatever edition they're in. Okay, let's take Castles and Crusades. Uh, I'm pretty sure Castles and Crusades is coming up on 20 years old. Uh, any printing, there's really no editions in Castles and Crusades, but any printing that you have of Castles and Crusades is compatible with anything that's ever been written for Castles and Crusades. Even more impressive... Tunnels and Trolls, the first edition that came out in 1975, is absolutely compatible with the Deluxe edition that came out in 2015 or 16. You know, I can take Deluxe rules and I can run first edition material for it with absolutely very little work. There's a few things that were added in Deluxe edition, like skills and different things like that, that if you want to use them, you just have to remember to add them into the game. Of our, into the material of the first edition stuff. But across the span of time that Tunnels and Trolls has been out, it's all compatible. Okay? I make sure my core systems have backward capability built into them. You know, that whatever edition I'm playing with, I want to make sure that I can use that for stuff that came out for editions before that. A lot of popular games do not go that route. Dungeons and Dragons, for example. The first few editions were all pretty much compatible with each other. That was when it was a hobby game designed and written by hobby gamers. But once we made it to third edition, fourth edition, fifth edition, they're not really compatible with each other. You can make them work, okay? But it's going to take legwork. Same for Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition. Uh, the truth of the role-playing game industry, if you haven't figured it out just yet, that editions never mean, a new edition never means a better game. It never means that. Okay? Take Dungeons and Dragons, for example. You'll find people that love every single edition of that game, and they swear it is the best. Why are there so many additions? When the big companies, you know, when the sales start slowing down on the current edition, the new edition's coming. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying there? It's all about sales. As uh, here on the Random Encounter show, we promote the hobby-centric viewpoint. Enjoy whatever game and whatever edition you enjoy. Don't let anybody try to sell you on anything else. 
I know I don't. Okay. Now, to our last factor here. Uh, this is dealing with core systems in particular. Uh, pay attention, beginner role players, beginning role player gamers. Uh, this is really important for me anyway, because you're thinking about the future of your own gaming. Okay. Many companies offer what I consider role playing in game families. My core games, other than Traveler, okay, other than Traveler, but my core games, I have three of them. When I say core games, I actually mean core gaming families. If you start off with, let's say, Castles and Crusades here. Let's grab a, a different book. Uh, we'll just grab the same book, whatever. If we start off with Castles and Crusades here. This is your medieval fantasy versatile system that can handle everything from Conan to Lord of the Rings. Okay? Uh, fantastic for that. If all you ever do is play fantasy, you're covered. But what happens when you watch a movie or you read a book or something uh, and you decide, wow, I would really like to experience a role-playing game in this different genre? You know, maybe it's Indiana Jones. Maybe it's uh, gumshoe type stuff, because we're going to move here. We're going to move over to some pulp gaming. But maybe you decide you want to go to some pulp gaming. Now, your casual systems, D&D, &D, Pathfinder, and all that. Pathfinder does have Starfinder, but for the most part, they don't have an analog game to move to that uses the same rule system. Uh, let's take, for example, Amazing Adventures from Troll Lord Games. It's part of the Siege Engine family. This game is presented a little bit differently and some of the rules are not really modified but interpreted differently. But at its core, at all the core mechanics and how this game works, it plays exactly like Castles and Crusades. They share the Siege Engine mechanics. So why is that important? Because if time is a value to you, you know, and you decide you want to play some different games, having games that share the same, more, same mechanics, more or less, you can move from game to game quite easily. There's not a lot of, there's not an extra mental investment on top of the one you've already made. So I really like the Siege Engine rule set. So I'm very happy there's a family of games that surround that. You know, we covered Harvester a while back here on this show. That's an anthropomorphic one like uh, Redwall or Secret of Nim. if I wanted to play that style of game. Let's say that I wanted to bump it into the uh, far future. Hey, they offer a supplement for Amazing Adventure, Star Siege, which takes the Amazing Adventure rules and gives them far uh, futuristic rules, you know, for lasers and, and uh, spaceships and all this kind of stuff. Hey, I love that, uh, especially if you're playing in a group. You know, you get a group together and you got all of you learn the rule set, okay? If you've played in groups, you may know that sometimes it's very hard to get players to move to another game. Even though the rest of the group's ready, this one player doesn't really want to do the mental investment to learn the game. Hey, if you've got a game family, there's really no big investment. Cruise over to books. It'll take you a couple of hours. So before bed, cruise over to books and you're ready to game tomorrow. Uh, Tunnels and Trolls is part of a game family. Uh, the kin Well, the Flying Buffalo family, I guess you could call it, because that's who published the majority of the books. Uh, but Tunnels and Trolls uh, has sister games, like Michael Stackpole's Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes. I absolutely love this game. It's a contemporary game that covers everything from pulp, Old West, uh, modern day to near future type work. It shares the rule set with Tunnels and Trolls. They have... Uh, let's see if I can pull it out. 
this is the Game Master screen, but they have Monsters Monsters. It shares the exact rules with Tunnels and Trolls, except it's set up for you to play as the opposing forces that you would normally play. Fantastic stuff. Uh, same with like RuneQuest and Call of Cthulhu. They share the same basic roleplay and rule system. Iron Crown Enterprise is sort of the champion. You know, they have lots of different editions of lots of different games that are very different from each other, but they all share the same core mechanics. <laughs> I, I guess you're, I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. That if you're bouncing around from game to game and constantly le learning new rules, I've noticed people doing that. They never seem to be really fluent in any game that they actually play because they're bouncing around so much. And a lot of their time spent studying and trying to figure out new games instead of gaming. So, where are we at? I think that'll give you enough to really look at, look at role-playing systems before trying them out, buying them, or whatever. And I, hopefully that I've, it'll give you enough that you may want to build some core systems yourself. Uh, in my library, I work on my game families when I'm doing my collecting and buying for rule systems because I found the rule systems that I absolutely love. And the fact of the matter is, is because of my hobby-centric view and the way I game, I can be influenced by anything from a TV show to a movie to a new book or whatever. And if I decide to run a game, even if it's just for myself as a solo player, I'm not looking to go out and buy new books or new systems. I've got what I need in my library. I just have to go through and pull out the appropriate rule system and supplements and, and quite and maybe I buy some kind of, uh, let's say if I wanted to run Middle Earth, for example, I may spend 20 bucks and get the encyclopedia or the history of Middle Earth. And I guarantee you, we can run a very in-depth campaign. <laughs> So anyways, I appreciate you guys sticking around. Uh, if you're just starting off and you've got questions or, or you need clarifications on things, hit those comments below. Uh, make sure you check out, if you're on Facebook, the Random, en the Random Encounter Army uh, Facebook group. I'm there. Steve Crompton's there. A lot of the other fans are there. It's very small right now, but we're going to make it grow because we're making this thing happen together as a community. I'll see you guys very shortly with a brand new episode of the Random Encounter Show. Hey, this is Dev Stalker 5. I wanted to thank you for watching the Random Encounter Show. If you love tabletop gaming, solo RPGing, or classic video games, make sure you're subscribed to our channel. If you want more of the show, head over to our channel's About page. There you will find our Facebook and Facebook group pages where you can join in on the fun. Want to help support the show? Make sure to use our affiliate and sponsor links next time you're shopping for your favorite gaming products. Anyways, I'll see you guys next time when we roll for Random Encounter.